I'd like to start by thanking the Reset Edu um, organizers for their kind invitation for me to join you here um, in this event today. Um, like many of you, I've spent the past year participating in Zoom meetings. So to help me feel a bit more comfortable on this stage, I'd be really grateful if, if you would all just do this with your faces so that you look like you're all on screens, and then it's going to make um, it a lot easier for me to you know, work about how this is happening. Anyway, to introduce myself, um, I'm a learning scientist. I've been involved in AI and education for almost uh, 10 years. Um, and in my presentation, I'm going to be, I'm looking for the, the clicker, I'm going to be taking um, a critical studies perspective um, to think about how AI um, can support teachers in their teaching. And I'm going to agree with almost everything that Professor Zupan just um, took us through, but I have to say uh, not absolutely everything. So hopefully this goes to our next, oops. No? There we go. Okay. So um, as we've heard, as we know, um, AI and what it can do is um, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, it can beat the world's best player at Go. It can automatically identify uh, diabetes from retinal scans. It can drive an autonomous car, um, which is why I have huge respect for my computer science colleagues, such as um, our esteemed professor. Um, AI also brings um, some amazing possibilities to education. Um, now, there are many people who would tell you about those amazing, um, exciting things, if only because AI and education is already a six billion euro market. So I'm not going to do that. Um, instead, you might think that I'm occasionally a little bit negative because I see my role as bringing a critical studies perspective, thinking about the very many challenges uh, that we heard about earlier and trying to get behind some of the hyperbole. So um, the question is um, how an AI and education connect. In actual fact, I think there are three uh, key connections. And I think of those in terms of uh, three categories or three buckets. So here's my first uh, bucket. Here's my first bucket. There's my first, here are my buckets. Um, and um, my first bucket is all about learning with AI. So in other words, using AI tools in the classroom to support teaching and learning. Uh, my second bucket is learning about AI, which we've heard a bit about already this morning. And my third bucket is um, preparing for AI, what I call preparing for AI. And this, we've heard a little bit about this today already. So in my presentation, I'm going to look at, um, begin with learning um, with AI. And learning with AI here, as it says, we've got three types, student supporting, teacher supporting, and uh, system supporting. So look at system supporting first of all. So we've got things like AI that's being used in university and school administrations for things like recruitment, admissions, uh, learning management, financial planning, a whole host of different things. I'm not going to talk about any of these, though, because these are not where I'm really interested. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about um, student supporting AI. And that's because there are many, many different types. And this is where, frankly, all the money is. So what do we have? Firstly, we have a, a type of tool that's often referred to as intelligent tutoring systems. And with these, the student engages with the laptop, and they, uh, the system will give them some information, an activity, a quiz. And then depending on what the student does, well, that determines the next activity, the next uh, quiz that the student is given. On the um, right-hand side there, they're a list of multi-million dollar funded companies around the world that are already offering these kind of tools. But these are not the only ones. We also have these dialogue-based tutoring systems. And these take a slightly different approach in that they engage their students in a Socratic-style conversation, 
question and answer, guiding the student to learn and what the system is supposed to be teaching. Um, then we have uh, automatic writing evaluation. This is growing day by day, mostly used for formative assessment, but increasingly, particularly in the US, and being used for summative assessment as well. And then we have this type of thing, which I call learning network orchestrators, where the AI is actually pretty simple, but it's bringing people together. This particular one on the screen, um, the smart learning partner from Beijing in China. And the idea is the student comes out of their ordinary classroom and they've not understood something about engines, for example. So they tap it into the app on their phone and that connects them with a human tutor. But the human tutors, they're all rated by other students, like a dating app. But the student gets to choose the tutor, and then they get uh, 20 minutes of one-to-one -one tuition, sharing the screen and sharing voice. Expensive, but still you know, really interesting. And then we have um, language learning apps. These are pretty much like intelligent tutoring systems. You know, Duolingo is an obvious one that I use daily. Um, and the difference, though, is it adds a, another layer of natural language processing on top of the ITS uh, functionality. Um, then we have chatbots. Chatbots are increasing all over the place and being used in universities and in schools. And the idea is the chatbot allows the student to find out something, such as, where is my next class? What day is my um, next test? And by speaking with the chatbot. So, that's a few examples of students supporting learning with AI tools. We've done system, we've done student, but what about teacher supporting AI tools? And the reality is, I haven't found that many. Lots of the AI tools the students supporting have dashboards for the teachers, but that's not really aimed at supporting the teacher to do what they wish to do. And I've only come across a few. And the ones I've come across are things like this, which is X5 Gone, which was um, partly developed here in Slovenia. Um, and it's, um, it's a tool that scrapes the internet to identify open education resources, exactly the resources that's appropriate for the teacher. Here's another one from IBM that does a similar job, and another one here from um, Clever Owl um, from the Lebanon. Um, but as I say, that's really all I've found in terms of AI tools that are specifically designed to support teachers in their teaching, rather than AI student supporting tools that um, effectively replace teacher functions. If they're not better than the teacher, then why on earth would people pay money for them? So, that was my first bucket, learning with AI. My second bucket, learning about AI, and clearly that's what the professor was speaking about earlier on. Um, looking at how AI works, how to create it, the techniques, the technologies, and so on and so forth. And so here's um, one that we are um, working on um, in UNESCO. UNESCO have been doing a lot of different um, uh, 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 projects centered on AI and the learning about AI. Um, in particular, um, there's a mapping project going on where they're looking at um, all the countries of the world to find out where AI is being taught. And a little bit of difference from, from Professor earlier, because there are actually 15 countries we've identified that do have a curriculum that's being used in K-12 schooling where they are teaching some elements of AI. So it is happening somewhere, but I do agree it's very uncommon. Um, the other project, the one on the screen there, is where we've created a bunch of resources for teaching about AI that teachers can go on, they can just grab. Then, of course, from the US, we have the AI for K-12 initiative, which has been working for quite a while now. Um, and they focus on what they call the five big ideas. And I have to read these, AI and perception, representation and reasoning, learning, natural interaction, and societal impact. Then we also have, um, across all the universities of the world, the various different courses, been mentioned earlier again, um, right the way up through. But also, from Finland, we have this, which is aimed at um, the average people, people like you and me, and it gives you an introduction, completely free. But there are others, there's ones in France and various other places as well. 
Um, so in summary, though, this bucket, the learning about AI, is pretty well um, developed at the moment, although lots um, long, long further um, way to go. However, what about my third bucket, um, preparing for AI? And we had a question earlier a bit uh, that kind of hinted about this. So um, the reality is that there are many institutions around the world that have been set up to investigate exactly this. What is the impact of AI on humanity? Here's one from um, New York. Um, so the questions are, how do we deal with AI hype, AI biases, fake news, um, the impact on privacy, on jobs, all those huge range of things. But the reality is, there's very little of this that's disseminating to ordinary people. Um, we need this to be extended. We need to break through the hype. Now, you might think from what I've said and the question we heard earlier that this bucket should actually be muddled with my other bucket. And I would agree with that because um, preparing for AI, in my opinion, um, should be fully integrated when we teach about AI. So I'm sorry, I do not believe that we should teach the technologies and then once we finish that, at the end of the day, oh, we must mention the ethics, which happens too often. I'm not saying it happens in Orange, but it happens too often in many others that I've seen. In my opinion, we need to integrate the two. We need to spend, if we have an hour to teach our students, half that hour can be on the technologies, but the other half of the hour should be on the human aspects. So in other words, if we're going to teach face recognition, well, what is the impact of face recognition on people? If we're going to talk about autonomous cars, what is the impact of autonomous cars on people? I personally think that is really um, um, quite critical. So, what about the um, AI in general? What about the biases, sorry, the, 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 the exaggerations and the hyperbole? Um, well, starting with AI um, in general, um, the reality is, like any um, innovation, of course there are hypes, of course there are exaggerations, of course there's myths. Unfortunately, many of them are, you know, a little bit more than reality. So, to begin with, here's an example. If I ask you to look at this and tell me what that is a picture of, you will all say it is a, a panda bear. Thank you. And the AI agrees with you and it actually thinks it's 57.7% confident that this is a panda bear. Pretty good. What happens when we mix it, though, with a bit of noise, a bit of visual noise? Well, we get this. I ask you, what do we have on there now? A panda bear, thank you. And absolutely. So now, the AI is 99.3% confident. Amazing, right? Unfortunately, it thinks it's a gibbon. So here's a situation where we've taken a picture, we've muddled with it just a tiny bit, invisible to the human eye, and it fools the AI. Here's another one. Um, this is um, from an Amazon pro uh, product called um, uh, 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 Recognition. And as you can see, um, it's facial recognition. So with this one, someone like me, lighter skin male, 100% accurate, pretty good. However, if we have um, uh, darker skin males, well, not quite so good. Um, lighter skin females, even worse. Darker skin females, you know, embarrassing. Now, you could argue, and many of our computer science colleagues would argue, it's early days. Give us time, we're getting better and better all the time. I would ask the question, though, even when this stuff is working really accurately across everybody, do we really want face recognition to be throughout society in all the places we currently see? I question that. Um, one of the other myths we often have is that AI doesn't need people. But actually, in my opinion, AI does need people. Um, a human chooses the data and cleans the data. Oh, what's happened there? Can I have the picture back? Have I pressed the wrong button? Oops. OK, a human labels the data. Thank you. Um, so this picture is from Kenya. It happens in many countries where the person's job, they turn up, they look at their screen, an image appears, and they draw a box. There's a car, there's a person, there's another car. They look at the next frame. 
there's the car, there's the person, there's the car. And they do that all day long. So when we think about these autonomous cars and how clever they are, they would not work without these poorly paid people in places like Kenya. A human designs the network. A human trains the network. And a human creates the outputs and makes the value judgments. So without the humans, AI does squat. So we shouldn't be thinking about AI versus humans. We should be thinking about AI plus humans versus humans, or humans plus AI versus humans, however you want to put it. OK, here's another one. Um, we were told excitedly this is the moment for AI during the COVID pandemic. But the reality is that many studies actually showed very, very little. And this is not just this one meta-analysis. There's been two others in big, important journals. And also, it's not just about COVID. It's about um, uh, detecting breast cancer. There are many, many studies that have shown that the AI so far has not achieved everything that we've been told it did achieve. It's not fulfilled its promise. So, that's AI in general, but I'm AI in education, so what about the AI in education hype? So firstly, there's this statement that we often hear, we didn't today, that AI is intelligent. Um, in my opinion, they're not. See, machine learning in AI, which as we've seen, the dominant approach, is about statistics and pattern finding, is about linear regression and more complex versions of that. But the reality is that no AI today, <coughs> no AI today, comes anywhere close to human intelligence. And no AI in education tool is anywhere near as intelligent as a human teacher. They just aren't. AI systems in education are actually extremely limited in what they can achieve. Sometimes they might appear intelligent, but that's a long way from actually being intelligent. Very often, in my opinion, it's all smoke and mirrors, and we should avoid um, being fooled. Here's another one, another claim, that these tools will save teacher time. You know, that's a claim that's been made for almost 100 years about education technologies, and it's never happened. Of course, we're told AI is different, and it will actually do it one day. Um, and I know that most teachers, including me, we'd love a tool that can really do assessment as well as I can. Well, they don't exist. They don't exist. They ignore how much um, uh, um, experience and knowledge I bring to the party when I mark an examination, when I mark an assignment. And it also takes away that opportunity for me to learn about my student. If all I get is a dashboard with a few marks on it, that tells me very little about my student. So maybe AI will save a bit of teacher time. Not a lot of evidence for that yet. But the question is at what cost to the quality of teaching and learning? And also, if it does save teacher time, with a focus on efficiency, which is a word I feel very uncomfortable with in education, what would the impact be on teachers' jobs? Here's another myth. Personalization. This is something we hear about all the time. It's an ambition again been around for about 100 years, which has re-emerged thanks to Silicon Valley. If we can have personalized um, recommendations from Netflix, <coughs> why can't we do that in education? Indeed, Pearson, one of the biggest education companies in the world, are trying to rebrand themselves at the moment as the Netflix of education. But for me, this completely misses the point. The AI tools might provide each student with their own individual pathway, as shown by the diagram here, through the materials, but they still take them to the same fixed learning outcomes as everyone else. For me, this is a weak understanding of personalization. It should probably be called efficient homogenization. Real personalization is not about pathways, but about helping each individual student to achieve their own potential, to self-actualize, which is something that no AI in education tool does. 
Education, as most of you realize, is also about collaboration and the other social interaction aspects of teaching and learning, which is the antithesis of the so-called personalization that so many AI tools claim but fail to do anyway. For me, it all depends on what you want your education system to achieve. Do you want students with lots of exam certificates? Or do you want students who are independent, creative, critical thinkers who are able to help society develop most effectively for the common good? For me, that's the choice. And then, of course, we have all of the tools that I described to you, the learning with AI tools. They adopt a behaviorist, an instructionist approach, an extremely primitive approach to teaching and learning, which involves spoon-feeding information, as I said, activity, test, activity, test, activity, test, and it avoids any opportunity to learn from failure. It ignores 60 years of pedagogical research. Not only that, they disempower teachers, turning them all too often into mere technology facilitators. Again, this misses the point ignoring the amazing skills that human teachers have that no AI tool can replicate. It also represents the commercialization of education by stealth, as education systems around the world increasingly rely on educational tools provided by the commercial sector, including big tech such as Facebook, Google, Amazon. And that's not the world I want. Data becomes proprietary, which is going in the opposite direction to making education open for all. And I worry that this is the next logical step. When a child is born, why don't we just shoot them in the head with a computer chip, with all the Wikipedia on it? Or perhaps we could do it with a pill. Now you think he's exaggerating again, but actually, Elon Musk is working on a system that is about embedding chips in human brains as a human interaction uh, process. But again, it misses the point. It conflates education with knowledge. We put the knowledge in the head, we've solved education, right? No, we know that's not true. So let's think about it. Education is so much more than that. But even if you reject my concerns, if you think I'm making a fuss, we still don't really know if any of the tools that I've talked about actually do what they claim to do. Where's the evidence? The reality is that almost no AI and education companies' products have been independently tested. Where are the robust, independent, randomized controlled trials? There aren't any, almost none. Those that do exist have most of been carried out in the US, which means that not only are they limited in scope, but they're also limited in applicability to other countries. So where are the robust evaluation studies from elsewhere in the world? In fact, I know of one big AI and education company that was offered money to do it, get an independent evaluation done. They turned it down. So what are they trying to hide? So, Here's another problem. Some tools also claim to be able to detect a student's emotion. Now, the logic is nice. They want to see if they can identify a student who is in a negative emotional state. Can we get them to a positive emotional state? Because that will help their learning. But using AI to detect a student's emotion, for me, it crosses a final privacy frontier, as does this. Now, this is a picture from China, but actually, the use of AI to monitor students um, is much wider than that. And in China, they've actually paused the use of this technology. And it's still being developed elsewhere. Exam monitoring during the pandemic. E-proctoring was used to make sure that exams were fair. The e-proctoring involves intrusion, fails to work properly, it prevents students taking their exams. It exacerbates mental health problems. The point is this is another example of automating poor pedagogic practices. Rather than using AI to innovate, do something exciting and novel. 
So why are we using AI to facilitate exams, which we all know are shallow and, and less than useful? Instead, where is the AI that's innovating assessment and accreditation? Now, the reality is that I've been super critical, but the AI engineers have done an extraordinary job. They've overcome some huge technical barriers to, um, to, to, to do this. And in a sense, they've climbed this huge mountain. But still, the tools they developed are very limited. And frequently, they are highly questionable. All too often, they reduce student agency. They're intrusive. They're not really personalized. Instead, they aim to homogenize students. And they undermine teachers and teaching. Most importantly, they ignore the bigger mounting of possibilities that AI might help achieve. So rather than automating poor pedagogic practices, AI developers, we need you to leverage AI's amazing capabilities to innovate teaching and learning without compromising pedagogy or human values, to empower students and teachers, and to support inclusion and equity. So AI often will start with them, the AI, in order to find the problem that they then fix. But I think it should be turned around. We should be starting with the genuine problems that educators know exist, working with the AI engineers to develop solutions. The thing is that most a &A education developers, they will focus on the symptoms rather than looking at the real problems. The symptoms are perhaps children not receiving the education they deserve, such as in rural areas or developing countries. And using AI technologies might help some of them. Oh, I've done it again. Um, but the real problems are the lack of experienced qualified teachers and poor pedagogic practices. And the AI doesn't do anything to sort that at all. Here's another example of techno solutionism. and this is from the UK. What's the problem? You can't see it. What's the problem? The problem is that the children were spending too much time queuing to pay their lunch. So what was the solution they introduced just a couple of weeks ago? Face recognition in schools. But what's the real problem? The real problem is that we want to make sure all our children have a good quality lunch. So what's the human solution? Well, let's have free lunches. Then they don't need to queue to pay. When I went to school, they were free lunches. And where is the AI tool that operates like this, but virtually as a, an AI exoskeleton for teachers that helps teachers to become super teachers? Part of the problem is that the AI engineers talk one language, and educators, we talk another language. And we need those languages to come together, but we mustn't allow the computer scientists to take control. And sometimes it needs people like us to bridge that gap. So, in conclusion, because I can see my colleague waiting for me to shut up. Um, in conclusion, um, the reality, I'm not saying that AI is bad. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm not saying that AI in education is bad. But I am criticizing current applications of AI in education and the way things are currently developing. In my opinion, we need to change that trajectory. So what I am saying is AI is clever, but it's not as clever as many people claim. AI is already having a major impact in education. And it has the potential to transform education for good, but if we're not careful, also for bad. We need to stop simply automating poor pedagogic practices. Instead, we need to use the power of AI to develop innovative approaches to teaching and learning that addresses real problems. We need to empower teachers and provide them with professional development so that they can decide which AI tools might help them teaching practice, and so they can use them effectively. We need tools that promote student agency, helping them to achieve their personal potential in and to self-actualize, not to homogenize them. 
We need to recognize that embedding commercial AI tools in classrooms is a commercialization of education by the back door. And finally, we need to ensure that AI and education meets real needs, is inclusive, is equitable, and that it serves the common good. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Holmes. Uh, it's not my intention to shut you up. It's, it's, um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the timekeeper. Uh, and and uh, we would like to, to use uh, the following minutes to, to ask uh, you some questions. If there are any, yes, there is a hand raising. So here's the question. Thank you for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, I come from Helsing University of Helsinki and I'm a researcher. And I have been thinking that we know from psychology that uh, we can increase positive behavior by recognizing positive behavior. But uh, when we collect data, for some reason we often focus on negative stuff. So we produce data about depression and criminal, criminality and, and those sort of stuff. And if we know now that AI works based on the data we produce. So I have been often thinking that could we as researchers and, and data collectors change the world to be a better place by starting to produce more positive data? Um, I have to apologize because I have very poor hearing and I didn't hear all of that question, I'm very sorry. Um, but I think the, the, the key is that, you know, we, we have a lot of people out there, academics, who take the position AI is full of problems and they kind of shout about it from the side. And then we have the people who say AI is brilliant and let's do more of it. And I kind of sit in the middle there because I think, you know, the reality is that AI is impacting education. It's here. You know, I'm not going to turn the tide. And so I'm more interested in how do we ensure that we do it in good ways, that we do it for the common good, that we do it to empower people, not to take decision-making away from them. Um, I'm really sorry if I misunderstood your question, but I'm very happy to speak afterwards if I've not answered it properly. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that we know that if we have data with always this, uh, that of very often from this uh, white, males, so can we change the algorithm if we start to produce uh, different data and can we change the world more positive by producing positive data? Um, can we change the algorithms? To be honest, I, I'm not an engineer, I don't know the answer to that. But the point is we need to change our selection of algorithms. Um, again, no offense to my computer science colleagues, but the number of women in, who are developing algorithms is very small. The number of people from the global south who are developing algorithms are very small. The number from other ethnic minority groups. So it's in the choice, it's in the ambition of the algorithms. So the two aspects, so the data that's used tends to be dominated, like the Amazon recognition I showed, it's dominated by people like me, white-faced men, right? And because of that, the outcomes are by definition not accurate. So it's about ensuring that the data is broader so that we have better representation, but that on its own is not sufficient. It's the choice of algorithms, it's the ambition of the algorithms. So in education, do we want the algorithms to replicate what we do already? Or do we want the algorithms to do something novel and innovative that empowers teachers and students? You know, that's a judgment call, that's a decision. And I think, yeah, we need our AI colleagues to make those kind of judgment calls. And we as educators need to be part of that, that discussion. We have another question. Hello. Yeah. 
Hello, thank you for this very inspiring presentation. I have a simple question. How do you evaluate the efforts of the European Union to, to create guidelines for, for AI creators? Do you think it's sufficient? Do you think it's hurt? Uh, it's the researchers work with their guidelines and recommendations. Thank you. Um, the European Union, as you might know, um, launched their principles um, of, uh, well, they called it fair AI, um, some 18 months, two years ago. And more recently, they've now set up an expert group that's specifically looking at the ethics of AI and data in education. And we have at least one of the team here today. Um, and this is fundamentally important. What I worry about oftentimes is when we focus on the ethics of AI, we seem to think of it as AI being this thing that's out there. But actually, AI is always dependent on the domain in which it's being applied. So the ethics of healthcare, the ethics of autonomous cars, the ethics of AI in education, they're all different. So they've got similarities, things like fairness, transparency, explicability, privacy, all that stuff is the same. But what we also need to do is to focus on the domain, on the education issues, such as, for example, the choice of pedagogy. So many of the tools I showed you, are, they, they embody this behaviorist, old world pedagogy. Well, that's a choice. That's an ethical choice. So we need experts in education to be part of that conversation so that those ethical principles are developed relative to education, taking education into account, and are, can be interpreted by teachers um, so they can use them and apply them and talk about them in their classrooms. So I'm pleased with the way that the, the EU has started, but we've got a long way to go. Okay, thank you very much. One hand more, and then we have our coffee break. Maybe sh let me be sure that the coffee break comes as soon as possible, right? Everybody's looking forward to the coffee break. Uh, I have a question. Thank you, Wayne, for the very, ins well, I think it's the third time saying inspiring talk because I think it's inspiring in particular because it opens new questions and challenges which we have to think about, right? And uh, the question is the following one, namely, the talk was about AI, right? And if we are associating with the AI ethics, the question is, isn't AI just one of the technologies where the ethics should be applied? I mean, for example, in the recent um, Senate hearings in U.S. or Congress hearings in U.S., they were talking about the algorithms. They were not talking about AI as such. So perhaps I think that we should uh, more concentrate on a broader picture of the technology as such, which is brought by the digitalization and all the influences this has on our society. And AI is just one of the technologies, isn't it? So perhaps shouldn't we concentrate more on the principles of the digitalization of the, which is brought to our society? And nonetheless, I mean, we can't make a real good decision about the, anything if we have no idea what the technology is standing on or what is the background of the technology which we would like to make decision about. Nonetheless, since the recent crisis with the virus, right, Nobody really understood how the whole thing works, and uh, that was one of the problems, in particular in Slovenia, why people didn't really uh, appreciate the uh, scientist's point of view. So isn't the picture slightly broader? So shouldn't, if we go into the, you, you showed nice pictures about AI for K-12 education, right? And there is also another initiative in AI for All in Europe about the framework, and this is also including the AI as such, as uh, one of the technologies which is coming with the digitalization. So the question is, shouldn't we talk about more broader picture, not about AI as only? Thank you. Um, 
you know, the history of technology goes back a long way. And we know, of course, that Plato um, complained about the use of writing, which he believed would have a bad effect on human memory. So in what sense is AI more than just another technology in that 2,000 years worth of technologies? I think there is a difference. It's because by being set up in a particular way, the AI is then capable of making decisions um, or make, uh, pointing in one direction or another automatically without additional human control. And because it appears, as I say, it often appears it's making intelligent judgments. It's not, but it appears that way. So I think because of that impact, um, because of the way it works, because of that automation beyond human control, because of that appearance, then we have to take it really seriously. So I agree with you, the other technologies, you know, uh, blockchain, Internet of Things, you know, we can go on. Those need to be taken seriously as well. But AI somehow holds them all together, is an underlying technology, it's a foundational technology. And it has this kind of scary um, aspect to it that we need to ensure that we remain control. So yeah, we should be looking at those other things, but we shouldn't um, underestimate the power of the AI. <laughs>